among the dead. Jesus is not there. is risen. I saw him. I saw him. This morning, we went to the tomb, and near the tomb was a man and a young boy. And the man said to me, why do you look for the living among the dead? Jesus is not here. So we went to the tomb and we saw the stone was upturned. The grave. The tomb was open. We looked for him. He was not there. You mean the master's body wasn't there? Has it been stolen? No, no, no. Let me finish. When we were leaving the cemetery, I saw another man. He saw how distraught we were. He said, woman, why do you weep? 
And then he said my name. Mary. Mary. And it was then that I saw. It was Jesus. I fell to my knees and I reached for him. Touch me not. For I have not yet ascended to my father, he said. But go to my brothers and tell them. Because he said so. Because he wanted it to be so. He wanted everything to happen. Just as it did. And I have always believed him. But, Peter, you denied him. You denied him three times. Yes! I denied him because I was a coward. We are all cowards. We accused Judas of being a traitor, but we all betrayed him. We all abandoned him. At least our brothers in the Sanhedrin who condemned him didn't know him. The Romans, we did not know him, but we, we ate with him. We lived with him. We knew he was the Christ. And still we betrayed him. Brothers, don't you, can't you see? You ask me if I believe he's risen. Yes, I do. For I know in my heart he will not abandon us. I know in my heart he has forgiven me. given all of us. It was written, the Son of Man will suffer, and on the third day will rise again from the dead to enter his glory. You are my witnesses to this. Now my Father in heaven is reconciled to the world. And as he sent me, so I am sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Go like lambs among wolves. Make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teach them the gospel and the commandments I gave you. Now, I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. O oh Lord, stay with us. For the night is falling and the day is almost over. Don't be afraid. with you every day till 
the end of time. You're abiding in us, and we are in you, and we are one, Father. I thank you for this temple here that you are building up. God, help us to hear and receive from you today in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And everyone said? Amen. 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 Now, we were awake for the first half, so don't fall asleep on me this half. <laughs> I was um, changing, or I was preparing, I should say, for this morning, and I decided to go a different route on my message. I haven't done that yet here, so <laughs> we'll see how it comes out. But I was thinking <coughs> this week, you know, people who preach are a little abnormal. <laughs> we don't think like normal people. And I was thinking this week, it was something actually I heard inspired from somebody else, or it was inspired when I heard somebody else talking about it, but it just really got me thinking about what was the greatest work that God has ever done. Have you ever thought about that? What is the greatest work that God, the creator of the universe, what is the greatest work, the greatest thing that he has ever done? Now let me begin by saying, those of you who are theological experts, this may not be 100% theologically correct in your book, but it is correct. So, so give me some grace this morning. But what was God's greatest work. And I think to find that, you have to open up your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, and verse 1. And it's one of the most famous passages of scriptures that all of us, I'm sure, know and have memorized. In the beginning, God did what? Created. Created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't tell us when he did it. It doesn't tell us how he did it, other than the fact that he just spoke into the nothingness and creation came into existence. And when you look at this world we live in, and the beauty of the world that we live in, now you have to take out, you know, the sin aspect, but when you look at the fact the world as God created it, surely God's creation of this world and of this universe and of all the beauty and all of its complexity, it has to be his greatest work. I mean, just here in this part of the United States, my favorite place is Yosemite. Going up there just seeing the beauty of the, of the mountains and, and the trees and the rivers, and it's, it's just gorgeous up there. And then you go west to the Grand Canyon, and you could go further north, and you have the redwood forest and those big, beautiful trees. And, and, and God just spoke. And not only did he speak and it all come into existence, but the Bible says he holds it all together. Hebrews tells us, by the power of his word. What keeps all of this from just falling apart and, and, and exploding and imploding about us? Well, it's God's Word that is holding it all together. And the complexity and the beauty of this world must be God's greatest work. No. You have to go further to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Genesis 1, 27, God also created, but he created something very specific. Genesis 1, 27, God says, 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image and our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over their livestock, over all the earth, and all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created. <coughs> You're not an accident this morning. God created you. He created you with a plan, with a purpose. And he placed, after he created you, he placed his image 
within you. And the abilities that God has created mankind, created in mankind, the logic that we have, the emotions that we have, the ability to love and to reach out to other people, the, 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 the creative ability that God has placed in man and woman has to be God's created work, and it has to be the greatest work that God has ever done. We were created in His likeness, in His image. Is that God's greatest work? No. no. we got to go farther to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 14, it says that the Word... And chapter 1 tells us that, or verse 1 tells us that the Word was Jesus Christ. And the Word, and then John chapter 14 tells us, verse 14 tells us, that He stepped down out of heaven. He, he took off, could you imagine the sacrifice that that made? Here is God, the creator of heaven and the earth, holding everything together. And He willingly made a decision to humble Himself. It tells us another place. He took off his glory. He, he, he didn't have it stripped from him. He willingly took it off. And he stepped down out of heaven. And he took on the form of a man. In order that he could live and walk and go through everything that you and I have gone through. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be thirsty. Bible tells us he was tempted in every way, just like we have been tempted. He 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 walked and he he loved and he had family and, and, and he lived as we live. Can you imagine the great sacrifice that it took God to come down and willingly limit himself to this body? And then he willingly, in this body, there's this great debate. Who killed Jesus? The Jews or the Gentiles? When the Passion of Christ came out, man, it was... Who killed Jesus, the Jews or the Gentiles? The answer is neither one. Jesus said, no one takes my life. I willingly give it. He gave, he sacrificed, knowing what he was going to go through on that cross. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he began to pray, he began to set drops of blood. And that's because of the enormous amount of stress and pressure that, that he was under. He knew what was coming before him. And then he willingly gave his life. God became man. Now surely that is the greatest, the greatest work that God has ever done. No. You have to go farther. And you have to go to John chapter 30, 23 and verse 46. And there it tells us that on the cross Jesus Christ died. God not only stepped down out of heaven, not only took on the form of a man, but God Himself died as a sacrificial lamb for you and for me. You ever think about that? And, 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 and John got the privilege of preaching on it. I wanted to give it to myself, but I, I kept myself out. Because it was the, the word that he preached on, it is finished. And see, that's what the great miracle on the cross is. That on the cross, God redeemed us. He paid the price. Our sins were forgiven because of His death and suffering on the cross. He, he, he took all of the, 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 the power the sin has over us, and it was broken on the cross. God went through that for us. 
And that must be his greatest work. Mm -hmm. No. You don't know where I'm going with this, right? Yeah. We've got to go one more step. See, that was Friday. Mm -hmm. But as Tony Campolo has said, Sunday's coming. <laughs> and on Sunday morning, Jesus Christ got up with all power in his hands. And he won the victory over death, hell, and the grave. Think about that. Because he rose from the dead, now he lives in us. He abides in me and I abide in him. And, and because he's living in me, see, the spirit in me is eternal. And, and the spirit is going to go somewhere. And because I'm in Christ, it's going to go to the presence of God. I have not only life, but I have eternal life. He saved me from hell. I know people don't like to talk about that, but hell is a real place. And when we're in Christ, God has <clears throat> saved us from having to worry about going to hell. He saved me from myself. He saved me from my sin, from my temptation. Now, don't get me wrong, I am tempted. But he says, wherever I'm tempted, he makes a way of escape. Mm -hmm. there's always a way out he always has a door we just have to be willing to look for it and open it the resurrection the power of the resurrection Christ in us and the life that he gives us and the, the purpose for <coughs> living that he gives us has to be God's <coughs> greatest work amen amen no <laughs> You see, when, when Christ rose from the dead, he did something no one else has ever done. Confucius is still there. Muhammad is still in his grave. But Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He has actually been on the other side. But he did something. You have to go to John chapter 8. There was a woman. <clears throat> caught in the very act. It wasn't gossip. You know how you get a group of church members together and they start talking about the person over there and most of what they said isn't true? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's not what this was. This woman was actually caught in the very act of committing adultery. <clears throat> and there's some things about the story that we have to remember. See, in that day, women were considered lower class. So you notice the man wasn't there, because the law says both of them, but no, it's just the woman. And they brought this woman and laid her before Jesus. Said, Jesus, this woman, she's got issues. She's got problems. She's broken. She's of no use. She is deserving of death. There's no grace. There's no mercy. There's no life for this woman. Jesus, this is not a situation of maybe she thought about doing it. This is a situation where we walked in and caught her. So now Jesus, as our leader, that you claim to be our spiritual leader, what are you going to do about this? Because you see, this is unacceptable. What are you going to do? And Jesus says, well, I know something about each and every one of you. <laughs> and those of you who are without sin let you be the first one to condemn her and one by one they walked away and the woman is there before Jesus and 
And he asked her, where are those who condemn you? <coughs> There's none, Mother. Neither do I condemn you. And you know the greatest thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ is it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if people want to throw stones at you or not. It doesn't matter whether you are undeserving or think you're undeserving. It doesn't matter if the things in your life you think there's no hope for, that you can't overcome, that you can't... It doesn't matter. Jesus says, I love you. I gave my life for you. You have new life and a new chance. Go. And sin no more. That's God's greatest work. Amen. Amen. No. <laughs> you see, while it's good that you have an understanding of what God has done for you, while it's good that you understand that God has saved you, He has forgiven you, that He has given you new life, I can't relate to that. But in 1983, I got down on my knees and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And He touched my dead spirit and He brought it back to life. He filled me with the power of His Spirit. And then like Peter, for whatever reason, He said, go feed my sheep. And the fact that that God saved me. A lost, confused, 17-year-old young man. That is God's greatest work. Because if ever anybody was undeserving, it was me. Because even since that time, I've done all kinds of things. And if I was God... <laughs> I would have been casting fire and brimstone down upon me. But just like Peter, he says, you love me? And feed my sheep. And God's greatest work is the day, the moment that he reached into your life. He touched you dead spirit and gave you life and he gave you hope. That is God's greatest work. And the one thing we have to do on this day is remember, it's not because of me. It's not because of who I am. It's not because of my past and the things I have done or haven't done. It's because of what He has done. And the newness of life that He gives to me because He rose from the death. Let's pray. Father, I come to you and I ask you to take us back to that moment, to that time when your grace first touched us and helped us to remember the great mercy that you showed to each and every one of us. That you saved us. That you transformed us. That you gave us hope and life. God, fill us with the power of your spirit. Give us strength. Help us to keep our eyes upon you. And keep marching forward. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. <laughs>
The soldiers tried to clear the narrow street But the crowd pressed in to see A man condemned to die on Calvary He was bleeding from a beating There were stripes upon his back Down the Via Dolorosa, called the way of suffering, like a lamb in the Messiah, Christ the King. But he chose to walk that road out of his love for you and me. Down the Via Dolorosa, all the way to Calvary. Por la Via Dolorosa, triste día en Jerusalén, los soldados le abrían paso a Jesús. Mas la gente se acercaba para ver al que llevaba aquel la cruz. Por la vida dolorosa que es la vía del dolor, como reina vino Cristo. Por la vía dolorosa al Calvario y a morir. The blood that would cleanse the souls of all men made its way to the heart of Thank you.